Welcome to Angel NB3. This is the boot camp for entrepreneurs. This is where you guys learn what it is that angels are looking for when it comes to investing in startups. So we have a nice room full of people here in Las Vegas and thank you all attending online. I'm Maggie Sailing. I'm the chief of staff for Startup NB. And I have a few slides to share about the program before we get to Nick. So let's get started. Angel Envy is a program of Startup Envy. Startup Envy is Nevada's statewide business incubator. We have two audiences. And tonight we're gonna to be hearing from Nick Jones, who's going to tell us everything we need to know about storytelling. Angel Envy is a program where we educate angels to invest in startups. And this is just the beginning. This is the entrepreneur education part. And then we gather together at least 40 angels in the spring and they listen to the pitches of the companies that apply and they whittle down by vote from 45 or 50 companies down to about 15 companies. And we hear a one minute pitch and then we get to a fewer number of companies and we hear a three minute pitch and then we get to a 10 minute pitch. After that, the angels vote on which six companies they want to pursue. And that's where their education really begins. That's where they learn how to do due diligence. So they work very closely, they break into teams and each team takes a company and they really get to know that company. The 40 angels put together $200,000, which is then matched by the SSBCI program for another $200,000. As it happens in the past, We've had more than one investment per cohort. Last year, we had two, where the first place winner made $200,000 investment and the second place received a $75,000 investment. In the cohort before that, we were able to invest in three companies. So as you get further down the path with the due diligence, people get very excited about the companies that they're learning about and they invest more than their original investment. Uh, here's the timeline. So right now we're just kicking off Founder Boot Camp. This runs until early January. The last session is on January 17th and the application is due on the 20th. Now what you may learn over the course of the coming weeks is that you may not yet be ready for angel investment. You may need to grow your company more before you take the plunge and make that application. And then starting in January 24th, we bring the investors together. They start with some education and they follow that path that I just outlined where we're listening to pitches and then we're performing due diligence. At the end, on April 29th, we have our finale event. We listen to all the pitches one more time. The angels go into a secret room and they vote for the first place. And if there's gonna be a second place or third place, they vote for them too. This all happens April 29th at Las Vegas City Hall in the afternoon. If you're on our mailing list, you'll be invited. So the matched investments is the critical part. Every part of investment that we do, which is not just Angel NV, we also have another fund that invests in our accelerator companies. We are be able to be matched by the State Small Business Credit Initiative. We're one of the partners with GoEd to do that for the state of Nevada. And Nick is not the only great speaker we're gonna have. We have a few more people coming up. We've got Liz Hyman coming up next with customer discovery. And then we've got John and Faye coming up later in the sessions. It's almost time for Nick. Let me tell you about Nick. Nick is an internet entrepreneur for more than 25 years, which means he was there for the dot-com bubble. He co-founded recently a local boutique venture capital firm called Varcade. The thing that he's spending most time with right now is Databoy, which is a very exciting company. And if you have time, you should tell us about that. He is an experienced founder with operations experience and also experience raising capital, which is what a lot of you folks are here for today, as well as developing partnerships with small organizations like the NFL, Universal Music, and Mandalay Resorts Group. More recently, he created JRNL.com. It's an online journaling application with more than 100,000 users. And so that business is going really well. But the Databuoy company 
that he is so happy with right now is one of his original investments when he created Barcane. And they are doing very exciting things with gunshot identification. They're able to 3D model sound to figure out where noises are coming from. And primarily they're working with police departments and figuring out where gunshots are coming from. Nick has attended the US Air Force Academy and has a bachelor's of science in economics and management from UNLV. And I can't wait to hear what he has to say for us. So take it away, Nick. Well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, that may actually make it so I don't have to talk about slide number two, but I'll speed through that for sure. Uh, actually, let's see here. All right, I think we're rocking and rolling. Uh, so I'm Nick Jones. And I'm really excited to be talking to you this evening about storytelling for entrepreneurs. The reason being is I feel that more than anything you're going to learn in this boot camp, storytelling is the most underrated and overlooked skill set of any successful entrepreneur. I can tell you in the last 25 years, I have seen brilliant founders, and I'm talking genius level founders, fail to raise a dime because they cannot articulate their vision and explain why their company exists. And it is the why that is ultimately critical. I've actually had other investors tell me to my face, Nick, I just couldn't connect with the founder. And I've always told myself, if I don't feel a connection in my gut, I don't invest. And I can tell you that whenever it's a founder that I'm backing and supporting, when another investor tells me that, you might as well tell me that my kid is fat, stupid, and ugly because it hurts that bad. And so what I want you to know is it's not uncommon for a startup to fail to raise money. And you may think, but Nick, good companies always raise money. That's technically not true. I also don't want you to assume that a good story can mask a poorly designed or poorly executed company because it can. But the reality is when you're pitching, especially for raising money, you're going to be competing with other companies across different industries, but they're all competing for the same attention and the same pool of money. So the thing that separates you in the mind of an investor, especially someone like me, is the story that you're telling. It's very critical that you're clear and concise with your story because stories are what stands out. So for me, storytelling as it relates to entrepreneurship is the ability to articulate your vision in such a way that the listener can see what you see and get passionate about what you're passionate about. And more than anything, and, and I wanna make this clear, it's so that they can clearly and concisely share your vision and story to someone else. In the last 25 years, I have needed to rely, and if you're raising money, I promise you're gonna run into this situation. As a young entrepreneur, when I was 23, 24, I often needed to rely on someone who had a relationship that I didn't have or knew a high net worth individual that I didn't know. And I want you to imagine being worried about making payroll or being worried about getting the equipment you need for that next major milestone. And now you need to rely on somebody else to tell your story for you. That is a nerve wracking feeling because ultimately if you didn't do a good enough job, the chances of you getting that second meeting are practically zero. Now, for me, I can tell you that storytelling has been a difference maker in my career. It has set me apart from my competition, and more importantly, it has allowed me to engender trust when I've needed it, especially with clients. As the Chief Development Officer of Data Buoy Corporation, I know that it has allowed me to establish business development deals that I know are transformative for the company and put it on the path to success and rapid growth. Now, to be told, storytelling is something that I've been working on probably longer than 25 years, all the way back to when I was eight years old, reciting poetry for poetry contests. But I can also tell you that while it is something that I'm working on and something I'm honing, I'm hoping that the experiences that I've had will be something that will help you. And if you take anything home this evening, I hope that this will be an effective presentation. Now, a little bit about me, because you may be saying, I've never even heard of this guy. I know who Nick Jonas is. I am not Nick Jonas. I am the managing partner at Varkane. And Varkane is a boutique investment firm, as was previously stated by Maggie. And what we do is we invest a lot of times in seed stage companies. And so from there, if we like how the companies are performing, we tend to follow on very aggressively. 
Our investment thesis is we invest in companies we like. I am a serial entrepreneur and venture investor, and I've been doing it since 1998. So as Maggie said, and I was going to comment on this, all that means is I'm old. I was here for the dot-com boom in 2001. I survived 9-11. I've gone through the housing crisis, and now I'm trying to raise money in whatever this is. And so let me tell you, that's an interesting experience. I've raised more than 20 million in seed funding. I'm actually in the process right now of raising about 16 million for two different companies. And so that's a fun, fun experience right now. But most of the money that I've raised has been in seed stage investments. And I believe that is actually the hardest money to raise because that is, and I, I talk about it later, but that is more like selling your vision. You need to re really get people to buy in. Usually when you get into series A and series B, it's about the metrics. It's about proving uh, product market fit. But in the beginning, it's about finding believers. I've also been lucky enough to be a pitch coach for a number of incubators. I've been flown around the country, uh, obviously pre-pandemic, to teach startups how to pitch, especially in live demo days. So that's always fun. I love entrepreneur uh, entrepreneurship and different ideas, and I'm very pro entrepreneur. So if you have ideas, I always love to listen and share any feedback that I can give you. Uh, I've also am currently designated as the primary presenter for multiple companies. Uh, when we landed the NFL, I handled that presentation. When we landed Caesars Entertainment recently for Data Buoy Corporation, I led that presentation. That is an awesome responsibility. I take it very seriously. Uh, and also I'm doing the lead fundraising, as I previously said. And last but not least, I'm the Chief Development Officer at Data Buoy Corporation. What does Data Buoy do? I'll try to summarize it real quick. Data Buoy is a DARPA-founded company that creates intelligent acoustic sensor networks that make it possible to detect and localize on an active shooter so that first responders have the information they need to save lives in a matter of seconds. We are installed at the Fremont Street Experience, and in the last 10 months, we've captured two uh, shooters or active shooters from different homicides and have helped uh, Metro close those cases. So we're very proud of the technology that we're putting out there. All right, so let's kind of get into it. Why does storytelling matter? I believe storytelling is your brand early on in a startup. Now, let's not get into possibly or probably the horrible logo and horrible domain name that you probably have when you're starting out your business. Just go to appsumo.com. They're all named horribly. So when you look at those businesses, what's going to separate you apart from all of the different competitors or other businesses vying for money, it will be your story. You have to be clear and concise and do not take this lightly. I promise you it's a difference maker. Stories are more memorable. That comes from the obvious category. Stories are things that we really embrace, right? We read books, we watch movies. These are the things that we bring in. Stories are easy to remember. When someone comes in and wants to dazzle you with data, no one is gonna pay attention to the data dump, but they will remember the story you tell. So they're more memorable. They also allow you to connect emotionally. If you just think about your life, the stories that you've been told, like work hard, you'll be successful. The American dream is a real thing. You're going to put in the time. There's, you don't quit on things. These are all stories that we're told that help shape who you are. Why does that matter? If you can find the little thing that connects to me, so I relate to you, I have that sort of, oh, that's happened to me moment, that will connect me to you. That moment is a bond that is hard to break. So that emotional connection really matters when you're storytelling. Also, I've relayed a, a little bit about this for stories get shared. What I really wanna focus on with that is if you think about it, when someone says, hey, let me tell you a story, don't you naturally lean in? And when you hear a great story, isn't it hard to not share it? When you have those stories that can get shared, that is the moment where your story becomes your brand. So that moment where you can trust that your story is getting shared correctly, you've created a brand for your business and a way for people to remember you. Now, there's an obvious storytelling framework. We all know that, that any good story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. But when you think about it from an entrepreneurial perspective, you need to be very granular with it. And you, a lot of times you have to be very precise. So when you have a story here, you need to worry about the setup. 
I tend to like to do things where I tell a little bit of a story that happened in the past. Maybe it's uh, just last year when I was on vacation with my family, I set it up. Then you need to get into an event that takes place. That event is usually something that is causing the problem to come into play, the problem that you're going to face. Where that aha moment or that discovery moment for you comes into play is when there's a change. What did you build or what did you discover that made this make sense in your story? And then obviously, when you're at the end, you want to have a resolution. I call it a victorious outcome. What do I mean by a victorious outcome? One of my favorite stories, I had listened to an NPR broadcast about entrepreneurship. Maybe you've heard it too, where the person was interviewing Sarah Blakely. I don't know if you will know who that is, but maybe the females know. She is the self-made founder of Spanx. What's so amazing about her story is they still use the story to describe what Spanx is today. And that company's worth a billion dollars. If you Google the startup story of Spanx, it will tell you something to the effect, and I'll probably butcher it, but it's basically this, that Sarah was going to a party. She forgot the undergarment that would make her outfit, outfit look smooth underneath. So the way they describe it, I love it. They say, and armed with a pair of scissors and sheer genius, she cut off the feet on her uh, control top pantyhose was the phrase, and the Spanx revolution was born. Now, if you think about that, the setup is the event. She's going to a party. She has a problem. She's not going to look good. So the change she makes is she cuts the feet off the pantyhose, and the company was born. These are quick little stories that are anecdotal. Why does that matter? Because it functions as a soundbite to allow someone else to tell the story of you. These stories really matter. All right, you're probably not going to see this anywhere else. If you Google a lot of things, you're gonna see a lot of it. And in fairness, the first one you probably will see, but the last two you won't. The first one, I believe that you have to do your research about your audience. I'll give you an example. If I'm going to pitch to Caesars and I want them to buy what we're selling, I need to know, is the person technical? I need to know that, is, that does my product affect their position as a job? If they make the wrong decision, could they get fired? How critical are these things to their decision-making process? The worst thing that I see, especially when founders pitch to investors, is they have no idea who the investor is. They don't know what they've invested in before. They don't know if they were a startup founder before and can speak to that very intelligently. And they go in completely blind. And what ends up happening is they pitch a story that actually offends somebody. So make sure you do the research and know who you're pitching to. The next one, is three minutes to believability. Now, three minutes to believability isn't gonna work for your one minute pitches, but what I'm really referring to is your ability to create heads that are nodding yes and agreeing with you. I pay attention to body language a lot when I'm pitching or when I'm sitting in the room supporting another founder pitching to someone else. I believe that the story you tell in the first three minutes is actually the hook on whether or not you're gonna close the deal. Now, some of you are thinking, no way. I had a 30-minute meeting and it was awesome. Well, I would argue that that first three minutes, they've already made a decision. It's kind of like a, a relationship, right? You meet someone and you just kind of know right off the bat. It's the same thing for an investor in a startup. So those first three minutes are critical. And we'll dive into that into an example uh, and we'll analyze it shortly. Make your idea theirs. Okay, this is also one that if you've worked with me and Amy has heard this many times, I am a big believer in planting seeds in other people's minds. What does that mean? If I can get you following along with me and finishing my sentences and nodding yes with me, I know that you've been listening and I know you're sold on my idea. How many of you seen the movie Inception? And you remember the premise of that movie was to win, was to plant the seed in, the, in their head and make it theirs. All of a sudden, they couldn't deny that the idea was good because it was their idea. They just found you, luckily. Those things really matter. And I can tell you that Amy's been in a meeting with me when someone has called us for a follow-up call and literally sold me on what I told her would happen three months before. 
it is a triumphant feeling. It sounds dubious, but I can tell you that it is invaluable tool and it's an art to be able to do this, but it's something you have to work on. All right, I am gonna focus on four types of storytelling for the rest of this pitch. The first one I call the elevator pitch and this pitch is verbal only. This is something that you have to rehearse. Now, depending on what you think of an elevator pitch, it can be as long as two minutes. In my experience, when someone says, hey, Nick, what do you do? I work for Data Buoy Corporation. Cool, what's that? I have literally that moment to answer the question and they've either checked in and accepted or they're out. To me, an elevator pitch is more like 15 to 20 seconds. It has to be verbal. You have to rehearse it. You have to pay attention to your body language, the facial gestures and expressions that you make. Record yourself on your phone, do it in front of a mirror. It matters. And that's gonna be the second most important pitch you make. The next is your origin story. Now, the origin story from my perspective is either for longer form pitches, a seven minute pitch, or it's even the story that's gonna be tied to the PR or the about us page on your blog post. It's going to be those things that you tell people to get them to say, oh, I totally understand how they came up with that idea and how they created the business that they wanted to put together. Your origin story, and we'll talk about crafting and developing a story after this, is something that you have to take time to put in. I can tell you that I have spent a month working on a story and seven months perfecting it. And I'll tell you about that when we get to it. Your pitch deck story. All right, your pitch deck story is the most important story that you're going to tell. And the point of your pitch deck story is what is the problem in the market that you're solving? It can't be something so simplistic. It has to be unique. It has to be something that you have identified that nobody else has figured out. This deck has to stand alone. It has to be able to be emailed to other people and they have to understand your business without ever speaking with you. I can tell you, if you Google it, there is an example of the very early stages of an Uber deck. It's ugly as can be. It's a PowerPoint presentation. There's no pretty graphics, but it's very clear. You understand exactly what their business does, why they exist, and the problem they're solving. I'd recommend searching for that and using that as an example. The last one is your internal story. Now, the reason I put this one in there is I think it's important for you to understand that when you have a startup, the story that you tell, not only yourself, but the people you're trying to hire is critical. And I liken it to being a religious missionary. How so, you might ask? Well, is there anything else in the world that is that where you're out there selling something that no one's ever heard of, asking them to believe, asking them maybe to invest. And then when they join your team, you're asking them to live through the hard times. I can tell you that when you're out espousing the gospel of your startup, your internal story matters. And you're not just finding people to work. In a startup, you're finding believers. So that internal story really matters. It's gonna be similar. You want people to understand your vision and why they wanna work with you. All right, I wanna talk about developing your story. There are three parts and we'll go through them. The first is craft your origin story. Now, it probably seems obvious, I've been talking about making everything personal, but what happens if you've created a business that didn't result from you cutting off the feet on your pantyhose and you didn't all of a sudden stumble onto penicillin? What happens if all you did was look at the market and say, man, I can make a boatload of money if I build that? Those businesses happen all the time. So when I say make it personal, I'm not saying personal to you, make your story relatable. You obviously solved the problem for somebody because that's the only reason they're going to buy it. Tell the story of your buyer. That's really important. You wanna use real experiences. The reason I put this in here because you'll probably say, hey, that sounds pretty obvious is because fake experiences are really easy to pick out. You'll say, mm, I don't believe you. That's not how things are done. So you have to be really careful. I would test your story against other people. Have them tell you what they think. What parts didn't they understand? Help users connect to your pain. 
obviously, as I said, if you're not solving a problem, you need to talk about, I ran into this issue or this user had this problem. And it has to be a real problem. A lot of times when I see businesses, they come up with a cute idea, but it's not really solving a major problem in the market. And look, for most investors, a lot of investors are looking for what I call doubles and triples, right? Companies that will make 20, 30, 40 million. Most of the investors that I'm pitching to, especially deep tech, they want to invest 10 million and get a thousand X return. Those people want to believe in that big problem. So don't be afraid to think big about the problems you're solving. When I was 23, I used to think, man, if we pulled a hundred million a year in revenue, we're killing it. That's a big business. And it is, but there are companies that are doing it per month and per week. So really think about how you're pitching and who you're pitching to and maybe what their expectations are. And you need to be authentic. What I mean by that is you have to be sincere in when you're de developing your story. I have a couple of stories that I'll share with you that I think are authentic. I'm gonna tell you a quick story. One of my favorite portfolio companies is a company called Revolution Power Inc. We call them Power It. And their first battery technology that they had developed was a non-lithium zinc air battery that when you exposed it to air, it had a chemical reaction and the power was strong enough that it would charge your mobile phone and then you could throw it in the recycle bin. It was a one-time charge. To me, it seemed obvious because I'm from Vegas and we are the king of, I forgot my charger at home or I'm at EDC and my phone is dead and I can't request an Uber. So I thought the marketable opportunity for this product was massive. The problem is when we tried to explain the offering and not a story, and the ways they could make money off it, not a story. It didn't resent, uh, did not uh, really resonate with anybody. They had a really difficult time understanding why anyone would need this. So I spent months with the founder and I started talking to him about his personal experiences. And he told me about this time that he was on a boat in Washington during the fall and it was cold and he was, he was out fishing. And he reached into his bag and he pulled out a pack of hot hands. Have you ever had those where you open the package and you put them together and then it creates instant heat on your hands? Mm -hmm. So then he went to grab his phone and take a photo and his phone was dead. And wouldn't you know, and this is 2012, the backup lithium ion battery he had in his uh, fishing bag was also dead. And he remembers thinking, man, why isn't there something that could be on demand like hot hands? And so as we told that story, it resonated with everybody, partners, investors. We had people wanting to connect with us because they would say, oh, yeah, it's that battery like hot hands that keeps everyone charged anywhere, anytime. That was the little soundbite we created, and it resonated with everyone. Now, let me ask you, is that story even true? Does it even matter? No. Identify the opportunity. One of the really big things that you need to do is you need to clearly pick out the opportunities in the market that you're solving. It has to be something that you're filling in. You have to explain the hole in the market. What is the actual problem that you're solving and how big is it? When people are listening to this, uh, well, you'll, you'll end up getting uh, to it later in a different presentation. They're gonna talk about your Tam Sam song. People like really big Tam Sam songs, okay? but that problem you're solving in the market has to be believable. You want to insert your product or service. If that's the audience you're serving, you really better focus on your product solving that problem. Now, why does that help? Being able to do this also helps you refine the product that you're actually offering. Most people build a product or a business and then it never ends up being that business because they have to iterate and iterate till they actually figure out what people want. I can tell you that there's a gentleman at Sorensen Capital in Salt Lake City, and he said something that I'll never forget. This was about six years ago. He asked me one time, hey, Nick, what do you think this company that you're telling me about is actually going to be doing in five years? And I was perplexed. I thought, whatever could you mean? We're absolutely going to be doing this. And he says, we've looked at our the last 10 years and our most successful businesses, when they figured out what made money, it was not why we invested. That's wild. So why did they invest? If they know this, they're investing in you as a founder, they're investing, do they believe in you as a founder? 
What is the thing that you are going to kill for to make sure you succeed? That is what they're looking at. You wanna be realistic about your customer. I can tell you, one of the most horrible things that I hear is everybody needs our product. Our product is for everybody. Wrong. Nope, not true. Your product is not for everybody. Your product is for a very specific first mover audience and you need to identify who that is. Lastly, the third piece, I have be vulnerable, be emotional, allow people to see where your weaknesses are when you tell your story. I like to be self-deprecating when I do pitches. I think that makes people laugh. I also think it makes people think, my gosh, why wouldn't he share that? He wouldn't share that if it wasn't true. And it makes me more relatable. Hopefully I don't sell too much of a self-deprecating story that you think I'm an idiot. So try to make sure you're clear on that. Connect with your audience. Depending on who you're pitching to, if you're one-on-one -on -one or if you're on Zoom or you're doing those things, you need to really provide a story or scenario that people can go, ooh, I've had that exact experience. I know exactly what you're talking about. Or my wife had that experience. Or my husband or my partner had that experience. You have to take that into consideration. And of course, as I've said before, you have to have a victorious outcome. When it's at the end, if you ever think about the companies that people love, uh, I'm a big fan of The Rock. I like Under Armour workout gear. I'm a big fan of his. People like uh, Nike, Apple products. People tend to be zealots about the brands that they care about. You want them to connect and you want people that use your product or use your service to have a victorious outcome because that is what entrepreneurs and that is really what investors are looking for to back entrepreneurs that are giving experiences like that because it creates loyalty and lifetime value. Oh, here. I'm about to play a video for you. I totally spaced, I apologize. Do we need to turn up the volume on this real quick? I've created a resource at nickjones.net. You'll see uh, one of my favorite talks about why in a business from Simon Sinek, it's a TED talk. I've also posted this video so you can look at it and kind of analyze it a little bit more. I've also posted about a four minute and 25 second video of Data Buoy. It's a pitch I did in 2019. We actually won an award for best overall pitch out of more than 70 presenters. So I'm very proud of how that one turned out. And then I've also provided a link to this entire pitch deck that you can access at that time. All right, I'm gonna play this. First off, I apologize. If you could not hear that, that video is online. You can actually access it, at, as I said, nickjones.net, that resource is available. I put it there because I was worried about the sound quality but you can access it. But what I really wanna talk about is that story took two minutes and 45 seconds. You can tell that I rehearsed it. I started crafting that story in April of 2016. I then presented it in June. That presentation was November 7th, 2016. So that means I spent six to seven months crafting that pitch. Now, what did I do in that pitch? my setup and personal origin story. I started with a music lyric. Maybe you couldn't see it, but I used a John Lennon lyric. I said, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. I then made it personal because I talked about how I was, my son was sitting on my lap and I heard it while I was watching Mr. Peabody and Sherman, kind of the things that parents do. I then talked about how my life started and I had this little girl who was born prematurely. And I wanted to share all of those moments that I had from when, our, when my wife and I met to when we got married and, and became parents. And I thought, how am I going to do all that? How am I going to bring it all together? So I searched and searched and everywhere I looked, there was nothing until now. I brought that story together. Now, the greatest compliment I got on that specific pitch is I had investors tell me, that their wife told them they had to invest, that they totally related to everything I was saying. To me, I felt like I nailed it. We had no problem raising money actually that day. The reason the guy was grabbing food at the beginning of my pitch is we were already done raising. I was just brought in to kind of show off what types of investments that fund had done.
So it was really very effective, very proud of that pitch. All right, I wanna to talk to you about storytelling tricks. Pause to remove your ums. Okay. I'm gonna give you a real world experience. I had presented to someone a massive client. The first 15 minutes, I know I dazzled them. I, I knew it. I could see everyone's face on the Zoom meeting. I thought, we got this. Then during Q&A, the person answering questions kept saying, um, um, um. The feedback I got when they told us they were going to pass on us was because it sounded like we didn't know what we were talking about. Like we didn't know how to answer the question that we didn't really know what we were doing. You have to practice and remove your ums. Pause if you have to. Silence is golden. Whisper to make someone listen. All right. I got a joke when I was showing somebody this. Everyone said to me that whispering to get your point across is not effective. I won't get into that. That's more of a political thing. But I will say this. When you want to make a big point and you want to get the point across, you speak quietly because people tune in. And you can use it once in your presentation. That is not something that you should be using all the time. People will think you've got problems. <laughs> If you don't remember anything else, this is a trigger phrase that you should use to get people to remember that hook line, okay? One of the things, I totally missed it. I forgot to mention this. I had heard this a while back on a podcast. Someone said in your pitch deck story, you have an opportunity to create that sound bite and you have to quote, feed it to repeat it. I love that line because you're creating something to feed someone else so they will repeat it for you. So if you don't remember anything else from this presentation, I hope that you'll remember that your storytelling is about having a clear and concise vision so that your listeners can feed it to repeat it. You want to use that as a hook. The last one is, let me tell you a story. Now, that one always works. People will listen and say, okay, let's get into it. Tell me your story about your business or why this stuff matters. These are things that I use depending on who I'm pitching to. They're invaluable. Putting it all together, this is my last slide. And this is probably better for your pitch decks and your when you're doing your rehearsal, but I felt it's necessary because this affects your storytelling. Storyboard. Before I write any pitch, I'm doing any selling, even when I'm making a presentation for a specific client, I write out the flow of my argument slide by slide. The first slide is going to be this point. The next slide, I'm going to make this argument. Then I'm going to segue into this next argument, and then I'm going to do this. And I flow through those things. Before I design anything, I write my story out. You can do it in Google Docs. You can do it on Google Slides, anything. But I craft it all out beforehand. Create natural transitions. When you're talking, you want to make sure that as you segue into those different points, it doesn't feel abrupt, right? So you want to talk. As I'm talking in the journal pitch, I'm telling you about this lyric and how it brings me closer to my children. And of course, you thought this, but I got married. These things all tie in together. It's part of your storytelling process. Create natural transact transitions. Use natural language. Okay. Try to avoid using slang. I know that maybe you have an urban clothing brand and maybe that'll work, but usually the people that are investing are in suits and ties or they're more serious. Do not use slang. Quality design matters. When you're a startup, I have to tell you, a good designer is worth millions of dollars. I am very lucky. I've been able to work with a brilliant graphic designer for about 17 years. When we've had a startup or I've invested in a startup, he has made them look bigger than they are and it's made a world of difference. So good graphic design, if you have access to it, does matter. And of course, rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Now, for that journal pitch, I actually memorized eight minutes. I knew all the transitions. I could click, I could tell you. I was so crazy about it that while I was driving around, I'd just pick a random slide and recite it. 
I'd be talking to myself. And if I didn't have tinted windows, people would think I'm crazy. I worked and worked and worked on it. You have to be that fanatical about your story because when you're telling a story, it has to sound true. Heck, I even paused the thinking moments. I paused the, I practiced the pauses. You have to work on that stuff. It matters. Again, if you don't remember anything else, craft a clear and concise story that allows someone to understand your vision and you want to feed it to repeat it. Thank you. So the question is, what is my opinion on a one-line mission statement or a tagline? I don't have a problem with it. It depends. Uh, does it actually clearly explain what it is you're, you're doing? And can you say it without using the word and? So, uh, Tesla, accelerating the world transition. Yeah, I would say that that's a good one. Uh, they're all about decarbonization, right? Their whole big thing. If you remember Elon Musk's pitch was the first slides was the world was on fire. We're all going to die. We're going to fix it through sports cars, right? That was the pitch and everyone bought into it. That was the pitch. So when he's talking about decarbonization, that's a very specific one. I think it can work. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I've been pitching my to a lot of people and when I tell people who are not my target customer, it tends to fall flat. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah. Should it not? Should I have a story for those people to get them excited as well? When I talk to my customer, it's great. It goes well. You know, I like telling people, friends and family and everybody that aren't my customer will know too. And I'd love to get them to rally or that, like to get them behind me and tell them their friends. Oh, uh, you're that is the plight of the entrepreneur, right? Is sharing your business with people who don't care, right? right? right. They're like, oh yeah, that's great. Right. Uh, let me tell you about what I'm doing, right? right? So when you do that, you have to make it relatable to them. So I would either come up with a story or come up with a really succinct version so you can move on. Like people will say, Nick, what do you do for a living? And when I know they don't really care, I just say tech stuff, right? <laughs> and it ends it real quick. Yeah, yeah. I believe it does. So it depends on how much time you have. So uh, it, the question was, is it best to start your pitch with an origin story? Um, am I able to still share something on here? Do you mind? I want to show you a quick pitch about uh, data buoy that I did. It's, I won't play the whole thing, but I want to play a part of it for you. Okay, so why don't we just do this instead? If When you get a chance, watch it. Now, that video is even more poorly filmed, but you can hear the audio just fine. And what you'll see in that pitch is in four and a half minutes, I tell you a, a real quick story about the tragedy of 1 October. And then I talk to you how it's happening all over America. And I give you statistical data. And then I pivot into all of the solutions that we have and, and all those things we're doing. That origin story, depending on who I'm pitching to, especially if it's a big investor, I want them to understand not only that I've been committed to this idea and I'm working on it, nothing's going to stop me, but I want them to understand how it came about. A real interested investor is going to hang in there and listen to that story because what investors want, believe it or not, yes, of course, we all want to return. They want to be passionate and invested in the companies that they put money into. You want to be able to, as an investor, brag about who you invested in because they're doing something good for the world or they're, they're solving a problem that everyone has. Those things matter. So they want to be able to tell their story because believe it or not, investors compare deals that they've invested in and they always brag about the one they got that the other one didn't get. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Is there a platform that can help you write your origin story? So I would tell you that a lot of the things that I put where I had developing your story slides and it was like one, two, and three, that is a, a good formula. You can find resources online. What I would say is when, you, when you're thinking about your origin story, don't be in a hurry. Really think through how it started. Now, look, I, I'm telling you, when you're crafting a story about a business, it really doesn't have to be 
your story. It also doesn't have to necessarily be true. It just has to be relatable to your product. I'm not saying just go randomly lie to people about things and make up stuff about your business. What I'm saying is craft stories that make sense, that make people understand why you're doing it. So think about your perfect scenario, your perfect client, and how they would discover your offering and how they would implement it. And then craft your story around that. That would be my recommendation. That's how I usually try to attack those things. Yeah. So when you're targeting a very specific industry and it's not affecting the public, how do you stand out? So uh, two of my favorite companies are deep tech technologies. They're not a business to consumer product at all. So it's really difficult for people to think about why it matters. But when I'm presenting it to investors, I'm talking about either the social good it's doing it has to be doing something, otherwise why does it exist, right? So I think about either the social good it's doing, the impact, uh, the battery company is focused on decarbonization. So we talk about that as a whole. If you're in an industry, you need to be talking about the problem you solve and why someone will love it. And then you need to talk about how your product fits that need. Uh, those businesses are usually the businesses that make a lot of money, right? They've solved a very specific need. They do it really well. They charge a good price. If you can get into government payment contracts, you're going to rake in the dough. Those are okay. Not everyone needs to invest in Facebook or this new cool thing that everyone's going to love. They usually go for the businesses. If you can identify the problem you're solving, that makes all the difference. That's when people buy in. They can understand it. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, right? So you're, you're asking, how do you go about talking about a business that maybe is too small, but you still need investors, but it's the business you love? Okay, well, number one, that's a good thing if it's the business you love and you're passionate about it because people want to know that you're going to get it done. It's not necessarily money grab. So you have to think about who that investor is. It sounds to me like you could probably use a small business loan. If you get angel investors, you're looking at raising maybe $25,000, $50,000 amounts. Do you have an idea of how much money you're trying to raise for this idea? Yes. So a lot of money. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know anything about your business, but you said two things I would never say. Number one, it's oh. going to be really expensive to build and we're not going to make that much money. So <laughs> those two things should not be a part of your pitch, right? I immediately listen to that and I'm like, you're going to have to swindle somebody and then you probably need to run and hide, right? So better really think through your your business model no no no, no. I, and, and i'm being honest too right yeah. yeah look i have a lot of ideas that i think would be really cool and they're small and <laughs> i have a t-shirt company that i want to build i literally want to build it to teach my kids about business I, I it'll probably make some money but it's so small it doesn't mean anything to me but i want to build it to teach them about money and wholesale and marketing and all those things right nobody's going to fund that so you have to think about if you're going to build it, you better be really skilled and have a, a co-founder who's going to develop the app for you and put in the sweat equity. You're probably going to have to give up 50% of that business, or they're just going to steal your idea from you and build it themselves because you need them. You don't have the money to pay them. They can build it. They don't need you. You got to be really careful when you think about those businesses. And people like me get really scared when I hear that you're not building it and you're not the founder. Like if you're gonna do a small business like that, it better be all hinged to you because I'm investing in you. You're telling me, give me money, I'm gonna pay somebody else and it's all tied to them making it work for me. So I, I would advise you to not do a business like that unless you can figure out a way to package it differently. Sorry, yeah. What percentage of your presentation should be the personal story versus Covering the things that the investors want to hear. Yeah. So um, when I've done a seven or eight minute pitch, I use the three minute personal story that kind of talks about the problem and the solution, right? I weave you weave that all in. When I've done a four minute pitch, my story has been thirty seconds, and I cut right to the chase. I think when you're thinking about the problem, you have to factor in how much information you need to get out, but you have to get your problem statement that makes it relatable, or at least makes people go, wow, that is a problem. Oh, you solved it, I need that. 
Uh, but for me, I would say typically uh, on like a demo day pitch when you're presenting in front of a room of people and I've seen seven or eight minute pitches, I usually do two and a half to three minutes to kind of tell that origin story, problem and solution. And then I get into all of the other slides that you normally have. And would you say that you do that then in your demo day? Just one stands out and be different from the others? Absolutely. So when... I, I can tell you that um, I've had to present at a lot of demo days. Heck, I've been flown out to pitch on behalf of companies on their demo day. When I pitch, I go, I try really hard to craft a story. I try really hard to rehearse. I really work on all those transitions, everything, because I need to stand out. In a room of 15 pitches or 20 pitches, everyone starts to tune out all the, all the, all the presentations start to sound the same. I, I got to tell you, I was in New York pre-pandemic, and I remember laughing, and I can't remember, maybe you were there. Every company had a trillion-dollar market. Every one. I was like, wow, that is amazing. All of you are going to be trillionaires. I, it was the most ridiculous thing. It was like one after another. I thought, does nobody have a serviceable market that they can really target? Everyone was, it was so massive. You got to be careful, right? You got to stand out from the crowd. Yeah, so the question is, when I'm starting a pitch or, or crafting my origin story, do I start with the elevator pitch or do I really craft it? Um, I think depending on the business. So for like a really personal business, which is a business to consumer product, I tend to really start working through in my mind the story that will relate to my buyer. And so I, I start crafting that story like I'm just writing. And then I try to read it and see if I even believe it. When I'm talking about a technical product, I get right into it. I talk about the problem that we solve and how we get it done, what makes us unique, what patents, maybe what intellectual property we have. And then that is more elevator pitch, right? When I talk to you about Data Buoy Corporation, I'm like a DARPA founded company. I'm telling you, geniuses started this company. If you don't know what DARPA is, it is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, basically the super nerds of the Department of Defense. So I say, I start with a DARPA founded company that creates intelligent acoustic sensor networks that is capable of identifying and localizing an active shooter so that First responders and law enforcement can save lives in a matter of seconds. I use that all the time. That, to me, is the elevator pitch. You either, you heard it, you either said, yeah, I need that, or you don't. You said you've been flown all over to do pitches for others, so somebody's asking if you're still for hire. Uh, it depends. It depends on when we could do it, yeah. Um, so I go to Missouri. St. Louis, uh, probably on Monday, Tuesday, I have a really good friend who's a general partner at a fund out there, uh, developing and maintaining relationships. The reason I say yes to a lot of those opportunities, as long as it doesn't impact everything else I'm doing, is because you can never have a strong enough network when you're trying to raise money. I have to build those relationships. And I'm also an entrepreneur idea junkie. I love good ideas and I like helping people. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so someone's asking if you can use humor in your presentation. And what, the, what, what I was so quick to respond was, I guess it depends on what your business is, right? If you're talking about cremation services, maybe not, <laughs> right? And I know a business that is doing online plan your cremation. That's why I bring that up, right? They are allowing you to pre-plan your cremation and they're booming. It's a, it's a big business, believe it or not. But if you're talking about t-shirt stores or something funny online, or you really have a good business, I think humor can work. I think the biggest problem with humor is if you use it too much, they start to think your business is a joke. So you gotta be careful with that. So someone's asking, so they're building games or they, they're developing a game and investors don't really know a lot about games. That's probably true. Uh, you probably wanna find investors who have invested in games. That usually is a big help but they know they make a lot of money. So when you're talking about the business, especially a game, I would probably focus on the virality of it. I hate to say it this way, the addictive behaviors of it. I would talk about screen time. I would talk about your margins and revenue. They're probably gonna to wanna to know about your marketing strategy because it gets really costly to convert people. 
people download and delete apps all the time. So I think you're going to have to talk about market execution and why your game is better than somebody else's game. And uh, I would really dive into that. How did you walk through how you came up with that? Like, how did you start? What framework did you start? How did you go down? I'm looking through the notes that you might have done it, but you can kind of go through that. Example. Yeah. So, for DataBuoy specifically, the greatest value in that company are the geniuses who are building the tech. Like, if you actually, if I actually told you how the tech works, you'd think it's voodoo magic. I mean, it's crazy impressive, right? So, how do I tell you all about the team without telling you about the team? I say we're a DARPA founded company. Everyone on the East Coast, especially in Virginia, knows what that means, okay? Then I use phrases like intelligent acoustic sensor networks. Sounds techy, right? So I try to be very careful with the words that I choose at the beginning because it makes people think, oh, smart, <laughs> right? That's what I'm working on. So those, I, I do that at the beginning and then it's all about the problem. If your team is your greatest asset, you gotta figure out how to talk about your team without naming individuals, right? With more than 100 years experience in building enterprise applications, our company does X, right? So you got to think about that. So, so when I'm doing mine, I like to start with the, I can just work them. Kind of just put uh, as much as I can do, just put all the details in. Then I'm, my process is one of the similar. It's kind of, how can I say that with fewer words? How can I say that with fewer words? And kind of try to slim it up until I get to two sentences. Or yeah, so I'm always whittling phrases down, right? And I try to pick the words very carefully. And if you don't rehearse it, you start babbling on and then it gets really bad. But what I would say is I always think about the one to three core arguments that I make that lead people to say, I have to have it and I have to have yours. If those are the things that I'm trying to get across, I'm trying to think of the arguments that support that belief. And I'm trying to hammer that home as much as I can. Like right now in DataBuoy, I'll give you an example. Right now, gunshot detection has been around for a while, but a lot of people don't deploy it because they don't trust it. Most of our competition, false detects. And you would say, well, we detect a gunshot, but what happens if it's a false gunshot? If any of you are familiar, there was an incident on the strip. I think a cue ball or something had shattered glass. Someone thought it was a shot. They couldn't confirm it was a shot and people went nuts. Employees from the restaurants were leaving, going home, and the casino had to shut down. They lost millions of dollars that night because they couldn't tell if it was a shot or just a loud bang. So what I have to do in those scenarios, I have to explain to people how our tech works better. I talk about our patented multi-sensor authentication process. I talk about how we don't measure sound, we measure energy. I always say things like this, especially when I'm talking to guys. You could put our sensor in a John Wick movie and we would not falsely detect once. And they're like, holy cow, that guy shoots a lot of guns, right? So I tend to use stories like that to get them to relate and understand that we're not like every other loud noise detector, right? Okay. Danny, did you have a question? Yeah. Hardware product. So can they pre-order your product? Yeah, so let me tell you what we did. So one of the biggest requests we get at DataBuoy, we we're a hardware company too, right? Everyone would say, can you fly out and do a demo? And I'd say, how many times do we have to shoot guns and show people we can detect a shot? It's like, I have to go town to town to town. So I hired this amazing video recording company called Studio Pilot. And what they did is they came out with us to Virginia and filmed us doing a elevated shooter test. And then I narrated it. We made this big production. And then we would send that to people. We did live demos. We invited people so they could see the news was there. And I used that. So what I would say for you is I would make videos to show people how it works. I would make it as authentic as possible. You can't bury yourself in debt making dem demos for people so they can test. But at some point, here's the biggest challenge for a hardware company. They say, hmm, who uses you? Oh, must not be that good if nobody's bought it yet, right? I hate that, but that's what you hear all the time. When we landed Fremont Street Experience, it opened up the doors elsewhere. When we're landing an arena, it's going to open up doors everywhere. Us landing Caesars is going to open up the entire strip in the city of Las Vegas. But until you get that, you have to figure out, okay, I'm either going to have to make a couple samples and bite the bullet and go into debt, 
or you're going to have to craft videos and spend the money to get someone to do a good job. It sounds like we have a lot of different industries represented here. And how do they go about finding more services? So I'm going to tell you what I'm dealing with right now personally. Okay. I am my two biggest investments that I'm helping are in Seattle and Virginia. And I am literally shaking every bush I can find. So instead of thinking, oh, I'm just going to find investors that invest in this industry, that's always nice if you can find them. But when you're talking about raising a small amount of money, and to me, a small amount of money is $100,000 to about a million dollars. That's not a lot of money, believe it or not, especially with real investors. When you're talking about that, you're taking whatever your note structure is, if you're doing a safe note or you're doing a simple equity investment, you literally are asking everybody. You're asking everyone to take a look. The best way to do it is when you're a part of an organization like Startup NV and a lot of investors are coming in and they're looking for deal flow. One of the hardest things as an investor is finding where to deploy your money. They're always looking. So I would tap into that. There's actually a speaker that's going to be here on January 3rd, Leith Martin. That guy's phenomenal. He's tied to the entrepreneur program at UNLV. I would definitely come here and meet that guy and listen to what he's saying. He's got a tremendous network. You have to get out there, meet people, shake hands and, and network. There's no substitute for getting out and networking. There, there's just nothing that you can do better than that. So every investor is I think they are. I, I can tell you that I've had investors that I never thought would cut a check and they came in huge on a deal. So it's taught me a lot of lessons as far as that goes. So the question was, how do you, should you focus on this idea that you're self-funded, that you've built it yourself, you're kind of bootstrapped yourself, or should you focus on the problem or the solution that you're solving? I would say you need to do all of it. When you're a company that has managed to bootstrap from the beginning, if you know the story of, I, I'm, I might get his last name wrong. I think it's Kevin Plank. He's the founder of Under Armour. His story is phenomenal. He actually went like 80,000 into credit card debt, lived in his grandma's basement to build the first Under Armour shirts, risked everything, landed Georgia Tech as his first client, and now Under Armour works with The Rock. I mean, it's crazy, right? So those stories resonate. If you're an investor, they want to know that you have skin in the game. I can tell you, I've had so many investors tell me, I don't want to invest in them. They, they've risked nothing. They have nothing to lose. They just gonna, they're going to take my money and they'll quit. That is a big deal, for, sorry, for a lot of investors. They don't show credit. If you let them know that they may be building what they want and not necessarily what the customers want. Well, yeah, so what you're... So, if you've invested a lot of money into your product and you've not gotten the traction you want, this is when everyone talks about fail quickly. They're talking about product market fit. If you've built a product and no one's buying, I promise you it's not the buyer's fault. You're either messaging it wrong or you actually didn't solve a problem. That is one of the hardest things to accept. So one of the biggest things that I've been hearing, and I've, I heard it first in like 2015, but everyone would say, you want to fail quick. You want to rapidly iterate. You got to keep making changes until you figure out what actually sticks. So you don't want to say, I've personally put in $500,000 into this product and we've got 50 customers. Oh, really? How much do those customers pay for your service? 10 bucks for life. Wow, right? Really bad business. So you're going to have to really think through that. But a lot of that is tied to when you're coming up with a business idea, you really have to think about the problem, the size of the market, how you're going to monetize it, what your profit margins are. You have to think through all those things before you go out and try to raise money. Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of meetings where people are really like nice to meet you and they'll never talk to you again. And not to question that, is it true that the first investor is the hardest to get? Yes. Yeah. Is the first investor the hardest to get? I would say, yes, that's true. I'd also say the first customer is the hardest to get. Um, my first startup was called load.com. We built amazing products back in 1998. I had Duke University on the hook. I thought, oh, we're going to get this as a client. We had this branded email product. And my competitor was brilliant. They asked the client, hey, why don't you ask them who else uses their product? 
And then Duke University came back to me and said, hey, who else uses your product? And I was like, oh, nobody. So the first client I ever landed for that software company was the San Diego Chargers. I'll never forget it. I got the call in my business partner's attic. The dog is barking. It's the San Diego Chargers. I'm like, I had the phones forwarded to my cell phone. I'm at the park. Sorry for the dog barking. He bought it, or maybe not, right? Maybe we had a service. What's even funnier is we had moved out of the attic about two weeks later. We're moving into our first office. It's one of my favorite stories to tell. We're moving into our first office. I'm literally unpacking boxes, and the team from the San Diego Chargers shows up at our office. And I'm like, first off, how did you even find this out? Well, the who is information on our domain name had my business partner's dad's house. So they showed up at my business partner's dad's house who promptly told them they have an office down the street. So the chargers showed up at this house. Probably we were like, you gotta be kidding me. Then we're probably relieved that we moved into an office and we had a tiny office. So I'm unloading the boxes. And as they show up and they have the chargers logo emblazoned on their shirt, I start loading the boxes back up. I'm like, oh man, you caught us at a bad time. We're moving into a bigger office. <laughs> And everyone's like, what is Nick doing? And I'm like, hey, guys, it's the Chargers. We're moving out, right? And, and that, that's how we landed the Chargers. It led to the Raiders, the Steelers, Patriots, Universal Music Group, Windermere Real Estate. Duke was too far gone. We lost. I mean, you know what? I'm a rebel anyway. Screw those guys. So anyway, as far as that goes, I would say that landing that first customer made all the difference. Wow, that's a really cool story. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to trying to teach my kids what it's like to run a business. They have a really slanted view of the world. Dad goes out and does these big contracts. And then I, they'll ask my kids, what do you want to do when you're older? And they'll say, I just want to take over your company. It's like fantastic, right? So I want to teach them all the little things, all those hard lessons I had to learn early on in my career. Thank you so much, Nick. Right, thanks, everybody. Well, yeah, so uh, if you Google it, there's one that actually defines a Tam Sam Som, and I think there's gonna be a presentation on that, but think about it Think about it like this, right? You have your total addressable market. This is everybody in the world that might use your product. Maybe you're selling water. Everybody needs that, right? Then you have your serviceable, uh, addressable market, right? Your Sam, right? So maybe you're like, well, I can't really go worldwide, but I can do all of the United States. Right, that's an addressable market at some point. But my obtainable market is really all of the schools because what I really do is sell water to elementary schools and I can make money on that. Now that's really granular and I'm making it up on the spot. So whoever's doing that next week will probably kill that. But what you need to think about is your obtainable market is really what you're selling. Because I can tell you when I think about your business and if I'm gonna get my money back or what kind of return I'm gonna get, I'm thinking about who do I think you can really land because you can't sell everybody by yourself? And is that market big enough for me to get the return that the charter in my fund requires that we get? You have to understand, most people when they're investing money, this is something that you'll probably hear about another pitch, but when they're looking at investing in your company, sometimes they have a minimum they can invest. They can't just give you $50,000. They can't just give you 500,000. The minimum check they can cut is 2 million. And it's, it's a requirement that when they invest 2 million, they have to own at least 15% of your business. I have lost investors because they didn't get enough of the company. They just said, oh, it's against our charter. It's, it's against what we do. Sometimes it's just how it works. You gotta know who you're pitching to. Thanks a lot.